Um, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we will um, we'll, we'll get back underway. Um, just before I start taking questions from the floor, see, I, th I thought I had it all worked out, Dave. I was going to start talking about when you first come into football and we would finish with the Dave Kitson Academy, but people needed a drink and a bite to eat, so the Academy. But I, did, I do want to ask you about, about the Academy. Obviously, the logo came up at the end of that... Um, at the end of that little kind of goal montage, what's why all of a sudden a Dave Kitson Academy? What's what's happening? What are you doing, and, and where do you see it going? Uh, so my middle one, who's here, uh, we go in the size order, so you can see which one it is. Um, he started playing, and then uh, a bunch of his teammates started saying to me, oh, "Can you just?" come and coach and do a little bit here. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of grew like that. And then the eldest one who's here, the T-Rex, he, um, <laughs> so he's a red and blue coat. And they uh, have got a first team. Uh, they're a rugby sort, but they, they, I got a call from their sort of games teacher saying, oh, we've got a really good football team this year. I really don't want to fuck it up. Can you come and help us? Yeah. <laughs> So I was like, yeah, no, no, of course I can come and help. And I just I went down there and I just really enjoyed it. Did you? Re yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. And they are good. They actually do have a really good, good team this year. So um, I was just thinking, do you know what? Actually, I, I really like this. doing this. Yeah, I yeah, really, yeah. really like doing this. I thought, oh, do you know what? I'll have a go. I'll have a go. Let's just see what happens. And um, it, just, it just went mental. They went absolutely mental, so um, I had to get bloody James Harper to come and help me. Who's, you know, that's how desperate I'm. But he's been brilliant. He's been, and it works really well because obviously Harps came through an academy at Arsenal um, under Arsene Wenger and came through with Omri and yeah, yeah. and all these guys. So learned a huge amount from the academy. Um, and I did come through in the academy, I yeah. came through in non-league way. So I have a view of football which is pretty much at odds with most academy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> How you would teach kids in an academy. But it's the important bits that you can't really teach. But then yeah. you can't actually put them on a bit of paper. And then half spills in the other side of it. So we sort of work really, really well between us. Um, but so this isn't this isn't blue coats. This is... Separate from that, no, this separate is from that. It's, it's, yeah, that was just what got me like you know, coaching the kids, and, uh, and I just thought I've never done that before. And I yeah, just, yeah, I really, really like this. I like seeing uh, like the progression, I like yeah. seeing like them getting better. And it's just, uh, it's really, you can see now, like, I'm really no, that's true. Like, and this really, is all, is, yeah. this is all one on one coaching, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we'll do, we do one on one coaching. So it's a bit like uh, you know, I said it's. When you set up an academy, sit down, baby. <laughs> when you do when you do an academy, you're like you you have academies around here, and all they do is cherry pick the best place. Yeah. And all that all that happens then is you just piss off all the people who are volunteering and, and giving up their time to coach the kids. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, and I was like, you know, I have to live there. I love it. I live, yeah. feel like. The, I've been adopted. I don't want to leave. I've been. I, I, I have to live with it. My kids go to three different Reading schools. My wife works in Reading um, at Blue Coat, funny enough. So if you do want to get your kids into Blue Coat, <laughs> she can be bright. So, <laughs> he, he's a surprisingly easy. He's a very low number. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't want to speak off. Yeah, you know, because I know how hard people work in in, in Reading, and, um, and 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 the footballing hotbed that is Reading. I don't think we need to do that. I don't think you need like a get some teams going out. No, no. That's... So it's you know, you come to me, I coach you or Hearts coach you. Or there's unfortunately, but fortunately for me, I've had a shitload of Reading academy coaches. Coming to me asking for jobs who have just been sacked by the club. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So I interviewed three on Friday. 
Wow. So, and they're signed to amalgamate with the academy team. So the eights with the nines, the nines, the tens with the elevens. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's a total mess. So I'm hearing all of this from the academy coaches. So they're all getting made redundant. So they come to me saying, can we, you know, this, can we get some work? Can we do some? So I'm just trying to take on as many yeah. as I possibly can and help them as much as I possibly can. Um, well, then it can work, presumably, because those academy coaches, they'll be session coaches, won't they? They're not, yeah, you know, yeah, they're not yeah. coming from kind of salary well, positions. But it can, only work if, <laughs> it can only work if the work is there. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's, it, 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 it's um, at the moment, it is, because it's just gone so mental. And, and there's just so many kids in and around. But I was always of the belief that, you know, so Wokenham and Embrick, which my middle one base for 55 teams at Wokenham and Embrick. Yeah. You don't want to start pissing them off. I started to get a load of kids coming to me. So my parents sort of can you coach this, can you coach that? So hang on a minute. We need to go to work and we can explain exactly what we're up to. Okay. Otherwise, you know, we're going to... And, and how, how, did, how did those established clubs react? What's the... They were fine. They were a bit like, oh, I see what's happening here. You've got a new call of our best players. And once I explained, no, 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 no. The parents paid for the session. The kid comes to me, I coach them, they go back to you, hopefully improved. Yeah, yeah. And so that's how everybody, that's how it works. That's how everybody no, so brilliant. The academy is a bit of a precious word, but it's, you know, the kids love it. If you say academy, it's good. Yeah, no, but at those... Certain buzzwords out there, elite pathways and other ones, <laughs> academies and other ones. Yeah. One. Can I they tell you... Kids, it doesn't mean shit for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I've got to tell you that quite honestly, academy don't mean anything to the kids, <laughs> to their parents, <laughs> to their parents. Look, that's that's brilliant. Look, really best of luck with that. I know that's just been something that's that's yeah, really kicked off the last few months. And um, but as I say, the second half of this evening is devoted to really questions you might want to ask. We have only got these two mics, so do, if you just stick your hand up and shout, then we'll do our best. To if once we can understand the question, we will okay, good, good. Starting with you, young man in the glasses, your, your hand was up first. Yes, elephant in the room. What are your thoughts on what happened at the pitch yesterday at the SDL? What was that? I missed. Um, <clears throat> you'll not be surprised to hear that we're wondering what you made of what happened at the stadium yesterday. Oh, okay. Um, The tennis balls, I said, I went on the radio, I said, they're not going to get you anywhere. No one gives a shit. Yeah. Um, going on the pitch, I get it. It's an escalation of the tennis balls. All that will happen is the EFL will make the club play the game behind closed doors. That's all that will happen. And perhaps a few people who to have the club's best interests at heart, fans, etc. Might end up with some pretty severe bans. Don't forget, entering the field of play, it's a three-year ban. Not just from Reading, but from every single ground in the country. So it will bind you <coughs> in three years, which I'm not sure... I'm not sure you want to do that. I'm not sure you want to put yourself in that position. Um... I totally get it though, I totally get it. Where I am is I feel that there needs to be some pressure brought on uh, other authorities. The EFL need to have pressure brought on them massively. Uh, I think busloads of, of um, fans going up to the EFL HQ shutting down that space, making sure all the media sees that, putting pressure on them, um, for me, works. Uh, the other thing, the other idea I had was um, Chinese embassy. So, no government likes to be embarrassed, particularly the Chinese, maybe the Russians as well, but in business, in business, the Chinese hate to be embarrassed. They hate... Uh, the diaspora going out and embarrassing the country. So, protesting outside the Chinese embassy, the Chinese embassy have, the, China, the Chinese government have the power to take everything away from this country. Everything. everything. No questions asked, they just take it. That's a good pressure to have. 
Uh, obviously, though, protesting outside the Chinese embassy, you've got to have to jostle for the position because there's, there's a few other organisations standing out there protesting as well. So, but those are the ideas I had. But I totally get where, it's, where those guys are coming from. Um, but I just, I think it, it's only going to get you so far. I just think you have to say, you know what, behind closed doors. And, uh, I, and then I don't, I don't see that getting us anywhere. Yes. Yes. Um, I think you're one of the few people who can give a balanced view on the like, mentions earlier in the talk. Um, and that man is John Beck. <laughs> yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John Beck. Um, for those who don't know, was my manager at Cambridge. How can you have a balanced view on Becky? That's why you don't do balance. What is John, John Beck. John Beck was way ahead of his time. Way ahead, in terms of gamesmanship. So John Beck in the 90s, when Cambridge went to, got to the playoffs against Leicester, was it? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. lost, but beat Leicester home and away that season, but then lost in the, in the playoffs against them to get to the Premier League in the inaugural Premier League season. Cambridge United, right? That's how well he did. Um, Got to the sixth round of the FA Cup, same season, season yeah, by the way. Cup, lost to Arsenal, yeah. was it 2-3-1? Yeah. Like um, way ahead of his time. Used to go to Italy to study what they were doing, warm-ups indoors, creatine, all that kind of stuff. When I went to Cambridge, he made me take creatine to lift heavier weights. Gave me all sorts of problems, so not maybe too far ahead of his time. Yeah. Um, but he taught me how to win. Him and Lionel Perez. Does anyone know Lionel Perez, the goalkeeper? Lionel Perez, the French goalkeeper, is famous for one thing only. That Cantona ship at Old Trafford, where he then turns around and does this to the sack. Lionel Perez was the goalkeeper. Well, right, the sums and copy. Yeah. yeah. Um, Lionel Perez and John Beck taught me the importance of winning. Uh, he'd find me for any little thing, piss me off. He And I didn't realise that he was actually gr sort of grounding me for what was about to happen. But I <laughs> the one story I remember about John Beck is that he, we came off, came off the pitch and lost. And then we, <laughs> we came in and he had like a little stool in the middle like this. And he, He'd gone out, and we were all sort of trying to blame each other for the, for the defeat. And he came back in, and he had this huge gold medallion on big hairy chest, <laughs> right? And, a, and like a, a tiny white, I can't even describe it as a towel, it's more like a flannel wrapped around here. And he had a you're, you're, you're venturing into Wally Downs territory here, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he had a um, bottle of fake tan. This is after the game. So he came out and he was like, that's I'm telling you. That's, we are, this is right after the game. We're a Nats fanny away from being a top team. And we're rock bottom of the league. Right? <laughs> a Nats fanny. And I'm sat here, right? That was my, so it was like a horseshoe change room. And he's here. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm here. He's facing the like the main lads who are sat in front of him. He's like, lads, we're a Nats fanny away. Like, <laughs> telling you, just you just listen a little bit more. And then he like went to do his legs, and he lifted up his thing like this, and his bollocks were hanging out like that. <laughs> and I was sat right, and I was like, oh, <laughs> oh god. And that's when I knew, like, I'm going out. But yeah, we got relegated to that system. But he taught me more than anyone else how to win and how to use fake time. <laughs> no, he was he was an incredible guy. He's like, there's a do you know, there's a place for the John Max. Yeah, yeah. There is, and they just get this sort of this stigma put around them that they're all their dinosaurs and this and that. Actually, he was way ahead of his time, way ahead of his time, and I probably should pick the phone up to him sometime and say thank you. I think it's a Spanish number now. Could be. Yeah. Well, Wally, Wally Downs is a Jamaican number. So Wally Downs, who you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I picked the phone up to Wally Downs the other day, international ringtone. I was like, that's a bit weird, Wally Downs. 
and uh, she must have been on holiday somewhere. And he picked the phone up, and I went, whoa, Dave gets her. Listen, I need to ask you a question. Right? Not now, not now, kids. And I bear in mind, I haven't spoken to him for 10 years. But not now, kids, I'm interviewing pool girls. I was like, where the fuck are you? He's like, like, I'm in Jamaica. I live here now. Yeah, I'm interviewing pool girls all day. I haven't got time. Put the phone down. That was the last time I spoke to him. Absolutely. Um, who's nailed yeah. Yes, next question. Yes. Um, so, obviously, VAR is a huge thing in football. Um, don't necessarily need to know your opinion on VAR. Everyone knows everyone's opinion on VAR. But are there any decisions that went for you or against you that VAR made you really take? Yeah. Do you know when we played Sheffield Wednesday, second from last game of the season, we drew one all, and I scored a goal? That was onside. I'm telling you, that was onside. And that is the difference between 106 and 108 points. <laughs> and I still feel rock. <laughs> that season, do you know, like, it's like, it's never enough, is it? It's never enough. But, you know, it, it's like, yeah, oh, you've got a solid gold house. Yeah, but the car's only silver. It's like that. So we were one of those six years, and it's like the Luton game, we were robbed. Absolutely robbed by, by, by the referee. Yeah, like it was, you know, honestly, it was, it was, it should have been a red card. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was so shit. It was like, you know, you just come off the bridge go, knowing that something's not right here, something's, something's gone on. Uh, the Plymouth game, we should have got something from. Um, the Sheffield Wednesday game, that goal was on. So I can still see it now. It's like I remember the ball coming across and it flicking off one of their defenders' heads and coming to me. I was like, well, how can that be offside? It just can't possibly be offside. So that was the one that I would have changed. Um, but VAR, you know, it's. My celebrations were always shit because I always used to feel very embarrassed that, that a grown man had to sort of dance around. And, <laughs> I used to feel really embarrassed about it, so a little bit like, uh, don't really, you know, grown men shouldn't really yeah. be doing this. So, where the knock on effect of that is, and the, and the good thing for, for me and <laughs> is that. You score a goal, goes to bar, <laughs> and then they say, yeah, no, it's good. Now I've got to fucking start celebrating again. Yeah. And that, that's embarrassing, like a grown man. Like, oh, okay, running around. And it's the reason I don't dance either. It's just terrible. I just, it's, that's the big problem with bar for me. It's just like, it's so stupid. There's a few big problems, but we won't go into that, you're right. I love how you said, oh, well, we know how everybody feels about VAR. You go, where are those people, where are all the people now who were going, oh, VAR, we need it to rescue the game? That's the single worst thing that's happened to professional football in 150 years. Yes? Who's the hardest centre-back you ever came across? Hardest centre-back you ever came across? Great question. Right, mate? He's in here. <laughs> in my pocket. Still there. Yeah. He's there. So in I've bits. I've got a load of shirts here. <laughs> From... I, I saw a few games. I, I know in my... All right, you've asked your question. Yeah. Right. You have so got some shirts here. I've got loads of shirts here. So if you want any pictures taken with them, I refuse to frame them on my wall. I don't want to be reminded of these fuckers. Right. So if you want to... If you want to come up here, but there's some weird ones. There's going to be really weird for you as Reading fans, right? So I'm just going to show you a couple, right? Stephen Hunt, yeah. Hull, right? Good. James Harper, Hull, Hull sounds and shit. <laughs> Honestly. 
Mickey Shorey, Ashley Villa. He's not here. <laughs> All right. So there's a load of shirts in here, and the guy that I'm trying to find is also. We, did you come here on your way to the laundromat or something? Yeah. What were you? Is this guy? Oh, okay. Oh blimey. That guy. I'll tell you a story about this guy. Uh, he's, he, he is. For yeah. this side of the room, that's no, really? Nemanja Vidic's oh, no. shirt. He's just oh, you got Rios as well, have you? There's Rios as well. So you're welcome to come up and put these on. Maybe you pick just take them off. Obviously, I know it's only nine more. Let's say, but there's some good ones in here as well. There's like look, there's an Ethan Marsden one. There you go. Who's this? How Robson can't be? He's to clean my boots badly. <laughs> All right. So, but to be fair, my boots are a two-man job. So it's like something else I've got. Anyway, um, so Vidic. So I've played against him loads of times, uh, Reading and Stoke. And we get the thing is with people from this part of the world are just. I think given what happened over there in, in that area, they're hard as fuck. They've seen a part of life that we're very lucky not to have seen. And um, so we keep the fuck out of each other for 90 minutes or whatever. But, uh, this was a, I think this one was a stoke. Uh, I think they've got, yeah, oh, so, oh, I might be right. So, oh, so it's a champion's badge, like oh, 07 08. For all the kids out there, that's what Premier League badges used to look like. <laughs> um, but we're kicking the hell out of each other. So after we go, I think he split my, my eye a little bit. And um, walked over to him. I said, oh. So, and the thing is, like, what would you call them? Like, I don't know who this guy is. So you have to kind of listen out for like what they're calling them. So Rio... Would say to him, like, Vida, I would call him Vidi. But he's like, Vida, Vida, go, go, go. You look like a man coming to work kind of stuff. So I'm like, oh, okay, it's Vida. So I go over to him, Vida. I said, uh, give us your shirt. I was like, got your shirt. I'm like, oh. <laughs> okay. Clean the brother way. I said, listen. He said, I want to take this home and as soon as I finish cleaning my car with it, I'll send it back up to you. And without blinking, he went, he said, oh, yeah, good, 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 good. He said, uh, when you get home, can you send me more shirts? Because I've got more cars than you. <laughs> Class. Yes, yes. Who's next? Yeah. The bus parade. The bus parade after the 106 season. Yeah, I was talking to someone who's, was it someone's old man the other day around, uh, around you? I was doing a talk for Caversham and like this guy came up and said, oh, I was on the bus behind you. I just saw some crazy guy driving the bus behind <laughs> you. I didn't know why we needed two bus. But uh, no, it was nice, but they had to, so we were all jumping up and down on the bus at the front, you know, like whatever way you can about. And they had to stop it. And come up and say every time you're jumping about, the front of the bus is hitting the ground. The <laughs> <laughs> so, so we all had to sort of go around like, yeah, yeah. And it's, like, and it was like, it's so reading. Like no one's thought of this. Like what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do if we win? You know, it's like, no, no one's really thought about this thing before. And it was a bit similar to like when when we beat QPR and we broke the record. Everyone was a bit like. Oh. <laughs> that was good, wasn't well, we it? Now. Yeah. yeah. So, and all the um, uh, fans obviously rushed onto the pitch, and we were a bit like, oh, they obviously want something. What are we, what are we going to do?" <laughs> so we went up to the box, um, to the you know where Sir John sat and the yeah, yeah. little plush seats, and we sort of walked out there, and was just sort of standing there going. 
<laughs> well done, everyone. I was like, where's, where's the old champagne? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then someone managed to scare up kind of like four bottles of Prosecco or Carver or Carver or something like that. The shit that no one else wanted to drink has been in the fridge for like 10 years. Like, oh, that'll do. And we're like... <laughs> <laughs> it was just honestly, but it was so great at the time I used to think because obviously I told you what I was like I liked everything to be done you know yeah yeah and everything absolutely on point and I was a bit precious about it at the time and I remember thinking you know like you know this you knew this was going to happen like what the fuck are we doing now when I look back on it I'm like that's ready yeah that's ready yeah like, well that's... one but one one, you don't want to book it by making preparations. Yeah. And two, and this is why it's great, is nobody's done it before. So you don't know yeah. what you're supposed to no, do. Exactly. And so you. Like, and I go back to like West Ham, who'd have been like crates of champagne and everything, and all the fans and all the rest of it, and all the fan zones would have been. And they'd have been the selling the t shirts five minutes after the end of the game, mate. The West Ham sell t shirts when they win a fucking against It's ridiculous. <laughs> So, it, but with Reading, it was like, I just, it was so, I don't want to use the word quaint, you know, it was more than that, but it was, it, it, it was just, it was us, do you know what I mean? It was us, it was the way we did it, yeah. not like everybody else. No, absolutely. Just, now I look back on it really fondly. No, brilliant. Yes. Yes. Graham, so how can you not have... Graham Stack. Who even asked me that question? You must already know the stories. Um, I can see Brian shaking his head. <laughs> uh, Graham Stack. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, yes. The um, are you referring to the Iron episode? Yes. <laughs> Graham Stack. Um, was Tell the Iron story. Graham Stack was mental. So, you know the bean up here? You know the in Cavendish, the curry uh, restaurant, Indian restaurant, whatever. He, um, he was always the one that was like, I want to eat the hottest thing on the menu. So we went down there. I want to eat the hottest thing on the menu. Everyone but a five are in. You know, this is going on thousands of pounds. Yeah, yeah. Everyone but a five are in. Kids jump up your vibrate. I was like, mate, I don't give a fuck if you know what you know. Yeah, I was like, if you're not eating, great, go for it. You don't. It's really not going to make any difference to me whatsoever. So, but you know, he did, that's the kind of guy he was. But he would take it then to extremes. So the iron is. What's your kid doing? <laughs> so, you're a good man. <laughs> well. So, <laughs> with the um, with the iron, that was card game because we probably didn't used to like drink or you might not gamble, but you were bored, you needed something to do. It was obviously before like phones and all that sort of shit. So you'd have people around your house doing bits and pieces. Now Claire's gone. I can tell you, like when we, <laughs> when we actually won the league after that QBR game. We went round uh, Eva and Larson's house, and he had a hot. We lived in Crows then. We had a we had a hot tub out there. You don't have any fun. <laughs> good, good. That sounds like them. Um, and uh, it was Eva. It was me and Claire. Eva, Eva's missus, Brynja. Bring yours, missus. Now, if you're going to be in a hot tub, you want to be in a hot tub with two Icelandic girls <laughs> who don't have any bathing suits. That's a good way to wind down the season. <laughs> yeah, we're back to Graham Stack. Yeah. If we must. Yeah. So, Graham. You. <laughs> Keep that to yourself. <laughs> so Graham was, after he'd run out of money or whatever, if, if they were gambling that night, so he'd run out of cash. Oh, I'm not just talking about you. 
<laughs> and um, so you would go to dares. And the dare, it got so ridiculous that the dare was how long can I hold an iron on my back? And that was the dare. Bear in mind, it's a gold debug. So you came in the next day, and there is an iron rack. Like a proper iron mark. Like a brand. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as I'm aware, because it was like a second, I don't know, Brian might, might not even want to get involved in this, but it was like a second degree burn. And it's still on, it, there's still an iron mark on his back to this day. <laughs> well, right. So that was. But I suspect you already knew that. Yeah, him and he. I, I guess with that curry thing, that's why he ended up in India, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. But I was always a bit bitter about that because I felt I had a little bit of a. I could have gone there and done that. I was a bit appeased at Steve not ringing me up and saying, oh, Dave, come out and help us. But it was like, I remember it was. No, I think they'd ask specifically for people with strange markings on their bodies. <laughs> yeah. It was. I remember it was. It was sixty. It was sixty grand for six weeks' work, mm. which was like that. The course of that season, and I remember having a conversation, and they said, uh, and they said, "Oh, you have to pay the tax." And yeah, of course, you have to pay tax. It's like fifty percent locked off straight away. Thirty grand at the time, and so like I know, like now I can snap their arm off. Yeah. At the time, it was whatever, and it was, I was like six weeks, you know, away from the family and all the rest of it. And the guy went, "Well, you know, what most of the lads are doing is just coming out and making six plane trips and bringing it back with them." I was like, "No, I can't bring it." Yeah, yeah, on, yeah. But Stacky went, "Yes, please." Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Yes. Next question. Yes. Do you get that? The, That's a good question. Yeah. Um, Did everybody hear that? Everybody heard that? It's great. It's a good question. So when I got when I got to Cambridge uh, United, <coughs> so I'd come from non-league, so I'd come from Alsley Town, and I'd gone to Cambridge, and I was honestly shocked that there was like real minimal difference, and it gave me such a massive confidence boost. Um, and I also say like. If I'd have been in, a, in an academy in the Premier League, like you never would have seen me again. It would have been a good thing for most people. <laughs> you, I would have just been lost, right, to the sense of time. So the way I did it was every time I was ready to step up a level, it says, right, step up, achieve something at your level, step up, achieve something, step up, achieve something, and all that kind of stuff. And I got to Reading, and yeah, you could see, like, yeah, maybe. Um, Murty was his feet were really quick Shorey was technically very good Harper and Sidwell was particularly Harper was very technically gifted but I was sort of more looking at who I was competing with I was looking at you know, I was looking at Nicky Forster thinking he's on his way out uh, Sean Bones up, the loveliest man in football by a mile Sure. Yeah, yeah. He's a lovely, lovely guy. I learned so much from Sean Gota, by the way, when he was away. Just in the short time I was with him, I learned so much. Taught me more than anyone how to be a striker. Did he? Um, what, what kind of what kind of thing? What, how, where to run, where to run. He, he taught me, he taught me this, which is what I teach the academy kids now. Right. Which is if you look really closely on Premier League games, you'll see Haaland. Uh, and if you can't see me doing this, by the way, so it's basically where you want the ball and what side you want it. So it will be like down to the feet or I'm going to spin and it's going behind. So you do it like down here or you do it this way. So now I've pointed out you'll see the ball doing it. Um, but it's not something you can actually see unless you're looking for it on, when you're yeah, watching yeah. TV games. Um, but it's really, really useful. And it helped my relationship with Sean and Murty when I was coming to get the ball and I'd be doing this in, in behind or, or down. And so we had that. And they'd be looking at you going, what are you doing with your finger, Dave? What's that? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but it helped me with that. It used to work really, really well. Um, but in terms of 
No, I wasn't scared. I, I, I wasn't scared of anybody because I was looking at Lloyd Abusu. Bless him, Lloyd was effective for what he had, but I wasn't worried. You know, technically, I wasn't worried. Um, strikers, I didn't have a great deal of, of competition. It was when when we started to play with myself up front, and I think I think I was having I think Steve, I had about three or four conversations with Steve Koppel in maybe five years. Outside of, you know, like, Dave, I need you to do this, and you just go there, and like in the change rooms. I probably had no more than three or four conversations with, with Steve. Um, these, but I used to talk to Brian every, every week, because you just find where you're, you know, who you want to talk to. Um, but Steve did say, if we can find another you, to play up front will be unstoppable now, and I was like, you know, good luck, you know, full of ego, good luck, and then they found him. So when Kevin Doyle came in, yeah. and I saw him in the first training session, I was like, no one stands a chance. Like, there's no, nobody stands a chance against us. Like, we're too energetic, too skillful, too aggressive, too. That was the first. Although thing you weren't before. the same. No, different players. Yeah, different but players. we're, but Cop said. Great. Yeah, yeah. work rate the same. Yeah, uh, will to win the same. Yeah, um, different skillfully. Kev could turn on a sixpence. How he did it, I don't know, because he was still a big guy. But he used to be able to turn on a sixpence. I naturally drop in more, mm -hmm. so that would take a defender out. He'd be able to exploit that same. It was just such a perfect partnership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was. It really, really was. Um, but I'm sure Leroy will tell you when he does his talk next week, he will tell you that actually he was due to start that season, but he got injured. Ah, right. So Kev wasn't actually going to start on the but it just, when Kev and I played together, it just clicked and just yeah. knew that like, I would drop in, Kev would go, he would drop in, but he would do all the same amount of work that I did. Yeah. So then everything became a competition. Yeah. Everything became, I'll work harder than you. Yeah. I'll run for, I'll track back more than you. I'll score, I'll win more headers. Everything became a competition. And that's like, you know. No, nah, brilliant. I was going to say you can't buy that, but you can. Yeah. It costs about 220 grand. <laughs> yes, we've got time for one, maybe two more. Yeah, anybody, anybody else? Yes. What did Steve do to gel that team? Bloody hell. Is that, is that just come from the guy next to you? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure, Brian? Because <laughs> I don't know if I can answer. <laughs> I, was, I think I alluded to it earlier that a lot of it, a lot of it comes from... See, I think managers get a lot of the credit. Mm -hmm. But I think, like, Brian, actually... Brian's the one who's... He sees a player... And he always used to tell me, he said, Dave, when I'm up there with all the other scouts and I'm looking down and I see a player, I'll go quiet. And what you find with all the scouts is they can't wait to tell each other that they, that they just spotted a player. So they'll start saying, oh, yeah, the six. Oh, yeah, yeah, the six, the six is amazing. And I remember Brian telling me the story about Jimmy Kebbe. And he was looking at Jimmy Kebbe and they just went, he saw him, and he just went quiet. Didn't say, didn't say anything. Didn't say anything. Didn't, didn't let any. Didn't let on. Didn't say anything. Didn't make a motion. But backed it up. Went back and said, "I found a guy. You need to sign this guy." That is someone who's incredibly skillful, incredibly talented, who has the courage of their convictions. But the hard work in terms of merging the team, it's already been done. It's already been done. Brian will tell you the same story about Kevin Doyle. Found out everything about him. What he was like, what, he, what car he drove, where he lived, what his family was like, all of it. Do you know, and if you have a guy who's... Brian found out all that. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. That's the hard part. 
took a, took a while to shake down those stalking convictions, though, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a bit embarrassing for the club for a while. That had to be kept very quiet, but... <laughs> sorry. But, but that's, that's what, what it's about. about. That's what it's about. Front, it, it, it's, the, it's the scout, and that, and that part of the, 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 the football club finds out. And they say, OK, we've got a guy over here, like myself, he's from Quiet Town in Hertfordshire, he's this, he's been at Cambridge, blah, blah, blah. A little bit quirky, a little bit different, but he's all right. Then does the next bit with Kevin Doyle. Then does the next bit. Then does the next bit and fits it all together. So I, I don't think it's actually. But the manager always gets the credit for that. He always gets the credit for that, and it isn't. It isn't that guy at all. Uh, we've got a mate, so uh, Brian is Simon Heggy. Yeah, he's, top man. Yeah, Simon top Heggy. Man. He's at Man City now. He's media relations at, uh, at Man City. He's the first guy to go to Man City. So if you know Simon Hagen, Simon Hagen's a bit of a wind-up merchant. So you remember when Man City signed Carlos Tellers, and they were like, how can we announce this? And Simon said, I've got an idea. Why don't we do Welcome to Manchester? Like this, big old sign, face it right out Old Trafford, really pissed them off. That was Simon's idea. Okay? So that's the kind of guy he is. But what he did, when they signed Aguero, it was... How can we embed this player into the country as quickly as possible? Well, we won't put him in a hotel room. We'll sort him out of house. His car will be Spanish sat nav. His phone will be Spanish. Here's all the Spanish groups for his wife and the kids. So they just get, they fall into it really quickly. And that's the sort of thing that Brian was doing 10 years earlier. It took ages for people to cotton on. And nobody realized because it was a club right there. But yeah. it's, it's, so there wasn't really anything that Steve did. Steve kept it all together. He just kept the plate spinning. But it, it's guys like Brian and Nick Hammond who, who put it all together. Well said. Although, to be fair, Steve was quite good. <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> no, it's just that he, he, it's funny. You Obviously, I spent quite a lot of time with Steve at Brentford, at Brighton. And everything that you say is true, but he would, he'd make those same things work. He'd, 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 he'd establish that, those same kind of cultures at every place he ended yeah, up. He did, he did. He, he, he did, did have... about Steve was it, it, if it wasn't working, he'd just leave. And no one ever thought you could do that. Yeah. I know media would make a big thing about, oh, 33 days. Yeah. You know, well, but, no, it's not, work. it's not work. It's not what you told them. I'll, yeah. I'll leave. And that's, I'm, I'm, I respect him for that. The best thing with Steve was, and what I learned most from him, was in the changing room, you come off, you come into the changing room at a hard time, and it, things weren't going great. Yeah. And you'd go, fucking, what's, what's not working? What's fucking, like, you, it's you, and blah, blah, blah. And he'd come in, and he'd, he'd always go, go quiet, go quiet. And everyone would go, and he'd make you go quiet. And make you sit there for 30 seconds, go quiet. And then he would nail really? exactly what was going on. Really? And I always wonder whether that was because he would sit up in the first half, he would sit up in the in the rafters and watch the game. Yeah. You know? But you have to have confidence in your team to be able to do that. Not to want to go down onto the touchline and like bark instructions and all the rest of yeah, it. Yeah. You have to have real confidence in your team. And we go in the second half, do what they told us. And it always worked. Yeah. And that's, I, I just wonder, someone did it the other day in the Premier League, sat in the rafters, and the, 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 like, the abuse on Sky Sports with Neville and Keane and all these guys, yeah. it's not like my day and all that yeah, shit, yeah. sort of shit. And I was thinking, no, it is. It is like your day. Because Coppel was doing it before anyone else, and you just couldn't be fucking bothered to notice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, one more, qu one more question. One more question. Yes, Mr. McDermott.
I'm not being funny, Bri. Never mind about the season. So what, what went on, what went on in Sweden? What? <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, we know what happened. We know what happened. We're 106 points, got promoted. <laughs> no, go on. What, what? Well, I'll give you a little a, a precursor to the to the script. <laughs> you brought this on yourself. Yeah, you brought it up, right? <laughs> I so I used to be quite, you know, always stand at the back, make sure everyone else is always being looked after. Some of the lads would run straight up to the front, you know, I am whatever, and check in. So we checked into the Sweden hotel in wherever I can't even remember. Some no, you didn't even have the good grace to take us to like Stockholm or anything. Some in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> and we check into this hotel, and there's a, like three academy players we've taken to make up the numbers. So I'm making sure they're okay. So there's like 25 lads queuing up. First few check in, go to their rooms. Next thing, I'm walking along with the academy lads. All right, got everything in my passport. Next thing. Get there and I haven't even. I'm halfway down the queue, <laughs> and my phone beeps. Open it up. It's a video. The first player who's checked in is in bed with one of the cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how quick does your work have to be? <laughs> so like, and yeah. I'm going. Well, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> On every level. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I've got the academy kids to take care of, so I'm like, and that's. What did you say? So why you and yeah, you're saying that's the moment you knew you were in for no, a good that's season. The moment, that's that, the that moment was I share with Brian where I'm like, oh, we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is. Um, but it was genuinely depressing again. Depressing because, you know, I don't know, Brian, if you're like a bit part, a part of the team that's been applauded. Not, like, it doesn't happen, does it? Like, you don't, your team doesn't get applauded off. I don't know whether it happened to you in that, that, that team you managed, whether they ever got a, a, applauded off the pitch. Yeah, what, so it's really rare, is it? What was the game, by the way? Yeah. And you know, don't you? Like, you know when you come off the pitch, you're like, we've done something, yeah. like, really special here. And you're like, now how can I take all of that and push it into the next game. And that, that, that was what it was. I, I, it just sort of takes you by surprise. Coming off the pitch at Preston, and Preston fans clapping you, going, what the fuck is happening here? Like, yeah. what, what, what on earth is happening? Why, why would that happen? And I just remember, like, I could never have known that we would go on and break the points record or whatever else. But I just, I, I think I probably remember thinking, We've got a team who can do, maybe not even the top two. Like, we've got a team who can do something. Like, finally, we've got a team that can do something. Definitely the playoffs. That's probably what I was thinking. We've got a team, because we beat Brighton convincingly, beat Preston convincingly, got applauded. And I was like, bloody hell. Like, this is, we, we're going to do something. This season we're going to do something. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I'm not saying we're going to win the league. I'm not saying we're going to finish second. But we're going to we're going to be there. That old saying. We're going to be there or thereabouts. But I could never have imagined like 33 games later, and you still haven't been beaten. It's like. And also, I think that. And Brian, you went on exactly the same run with your team, where. And you almost don't. It's like autopilot. You almost don't really know how it's happening. And just turning up for games so full of confidence. Yeah. And sometimes I think you might even be turning up against teams who like might be better. 
So we played Southampton away, thinking they're definitely the better team. Leicester, when we got promoted to Leicester, Leicester were the better team hmm. that day. That couldn't beat us. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's uh, that happened a few times in the season. There was a few times when we played we played teams who they're the better team on the day. Yeah, but we're going to beat that you could, anyway. That yeah, couldn't yeah. beat us. Yeah, you know, and I, I just think that sort of. And we also had a thing. I don't, I don't know whether anyone's ever heard this, but we had a big thing that. Right, who bought? Who bought in? Um, who was who was that team that that came in that implemented the growler? Yeah, so there was like a like a company that came in, and they sat down and they were doing all the stats. This is where you need to be, and all mm. the rest of it. <laughs> but they came up with this concept called the growler, which obviously everyone loved. It was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. But the, the growler is when no, no, this is this is why it works so well. The growler was when you were under the cosh. Somebody would shout out Growler, and it was usually <laughs> Evar or Harps. They would shout out Growler. <laughs> this is true, honestly. And for five minutes, we would have to work our bollocks off. We'd up our tempo. Yeah, yeah. For five, this must have come out. Does anyone know this story? The Growler. You remember this, right? Don't you? The Growler. It was a proper, and it worked so well. So every time we were under the cosh and our backs were to the wall, someone would shout growler, and everyone would shout growler around, and for five minutes we'd fucking just like, just work our bollocks off, which is obviously a nice metaphor in terms of growling. And, uh, and, and, and it would work, and it would take the sting out of the game, and we would get, we would get back on top, and, um, and, and, and and start to get back in the game again. Yeah, brilliant. It was, yeah. Growler! Growler, honestly. Um, walking around red and growler. <laughs> hey, look, um, it, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It, to be honest, it's breaking me heart a bit, really, what we've been talking, everything we've been talking about this evening, and I think about what happened at the stadium yesterday and yeah. what has brought us to that point. But, but that's for another day. Tonight, it's just to say, Dave, thank you so much. Um, absolutely brilliant hour and a half. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks to everybody for being here. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much.